Welcome to New Every Morning as we celebrate the sovereignty and authority of Jesus in our worship from the readings from Mark's Gospel, the letter of James and listen to Rosemary sharing one of her heroines of the Bible. I pray whatever sort of week we've had that we will be reassured by God's promises by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit as we listen to our first hymn, The Splendour of the King. we pray as we continue with the service we pray that the Holy Spirit will teach us to be true to the peace that comes from God as God's children we have work to do and all of us have a responsibility to make sure that we help for social justice for faithfulness for integrity and are obedient to God and the Holy Spirit just as Jesus was obedient to his Father. 
and we pray that we can dedicate our lives in his service today and always. Amen. Every week we ask someone to talk about a scripture or a passage or even a book which has been a blessing to them. This week we will hear from Rosemary as she talks to us about her hearing from the scriptures. So thank you, Rosemary. One of my favourite Bible characters is Martha. I wouldn't exactly say she was my hero, but I think I have quite a bit in common with her. She is described in the Gospels of Luke and John. Martha was the sister of Mary and Lazarus of Bethany. There are two main stories about her. The first is when Jesus visits the family house. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister's left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset over all these details, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. The second story is where Martha is a witness to Jesus raising her brother Lazarus from the dead. Martha rushes out to meet Jesus on his way when she heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would have not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe that? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. As the narrative continues, Martha calls her sister Mary to see Jesus. Jesus has Mary bring him to Lazarus' tomb, where he commands the stone to be removed from the entrance. Martha here objects, But Lord, by this time there is a bad odour, for he's been there four days. To which Jesus replies, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? They then take away the stone, and Jesus prays and calls Lazarus forth alive from the tomb. I find that uh, I really warm to Martha because I see myself as having quite a bit in common with her. Like her, I know I'm a doer. I like being fairly practical and I'm definitely a detailed person. Here's Martha uh, being realistic with her concerns about a dead body smelling in hot climates. And in the story of Jesus coming for a meal, her concern is to make the very best preparations she can and to entertain him properly. Um, it's Martha that Jesus makes that great statement about the resurrection um, and also the fact that there's room for, for both types, for those of us who prefer to do and those who are able to reflect and listen and learn. I know I find reflection quite hard. Um, I just find it wonderful that Martha replies directly that she believes. At times I know this is challenging, as I often have doubts about faith and belief, but Martha is definitely someone that's a, an example to me.
We are now going to hear a passage of scripture from the Epistle of James, read by Ivan. The first reading is taken from James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Taming the tongue. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and in itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth came praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grape wine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello. I wonder if you can complete this sentence. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but... That's right. Words will never hurt me. Well, that's what school children used to say to each other many years ago. But actually, we know that's not true, don't we? In the last few years, even just the last five years, we are much more aware of mental health and mental challenges. And we know that very often the people who come forward and talk about them, they might be famous sports star or media stars or politicians. They have mental problems. They have stress because of the words that have been spoken to them or about them. And that's what we're going to concentrate on today. We're going to think about words, whether they're words actually spoken or these days, of course, they might be words in an email message, in a text, in a social on social media. The kind of things that you dash off in just a few seconds. And yet the effect of those words can be really uh, powerful. And so this is for everyone who uses words uh, in whatever context, in whatever way. And this passage from James chapter 3, it starts with a warning. And it says, not many of you should presume to be teachers. Ooh, uh, well, um, yes, that's me, I guess. I'm trying to teach. Uh, and teachers, the whole idea is that teachers should really uh, set a good example because our words can influence people, can really make a difference. And it says here that we should live up to an ideal standard. We should be perfect. We should be able to control everything, including our tongues. So that's a challenge to start off with and uh, one I need to bear in mind. So now we come on to the tongue itself. And James tells us that the, that the tongue is powerful and it's dangerous. And uh, to illustrate this, he uses three pictures which his readers would have immediately identified of a small thing controlling a great thing. And so you have a small piece of metal, a bit. And if you put it in a horse's mouth, that large and, uh, and uh, um, energetic animal can be controlled 
and uh, can be shown which way to go and how to behave. The second picture is a rudder and just a small piece of wood or metal and yet that determines in which direction a much larger construction, the ship uh, known in those times or one that's much, much larger from today can be controlled and whatever the rudder turns, that's what the ship does. As we saw with the disastrous consequences when the ship, the container ship ran aground in the Suez Canal and blocked it. And then the third picture, it's of fire. And of course, we've heard a lot about wildfires recently, whether it's the Western United States or France or Greece or other countries, a real example of global warning, warming. But they're started with just a small spark. And the spark catches light and the wind's in the wrong direction or the right direction. Uh, and very soon you've got a blaze on your hands. And if it isn't controlled quickly, it can become a wildfire and what uh, terrible consequences they can have. So James is saying that the tongue is like this and that really uh, we have to make sure that, that, that its power is used in the right way. After all, the tongue is small and yet uh, it can really make a difference. Think of the times when you've said to yourself or thought, ah, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. The words have come tumbling out of your mouth and you haven't, you, it's too late, but you, you want to stop them. But no, they've had an effect on the person who reads them or hears them. Or perhaps uh, more tellingly, I wish I had said that. And you've been talking to somebody uh, or texting them or whatever, and you've missed an opportunity to say something really important. Uh, it might be a question of talking to friends who aren't Christians and you haven't made it clear that you are a Christian. But again, the opportunity is missed uh, and you're never going to get it back in the same way. And that's why using the tongue is really important. Uh, and um, the, real, the, the thing is that uh, in what we say, in what we write, we need to have the highest possible standards and to be really consistent um, in everything that happens. So, for example, if you go to church one day and you, you're, you're driving along and you, your head is full of, of, of blessed thoughts and you're looking forward to, to the service uh, and then suddenly you, you, you get to the car park and there's a car blocking the car park or you're driving along and, and a car overtakes you and cuts you up and forces you to brake suddenly. Where do those thoughts go that you were thinking before? Do they stay the same? Well, quite possibly not. And, and they might even lead to words. Or maybe you've been to church and you go home and then suddenly there's a blazing row with your neighbour. Uh, or you make rude comments about the politicians you see on television. James really uses some very strong words here. He calls the tongue uh, full of deadly poison. He says that animals can be tamed, but the tongue cannot be tamed, and no one can control the tongue. Well, yes, uh, in a way that's true, uh, and uh, we do. Uh, we need to note that uh, that. that what we say and what we write have real effect. But actually, I think that the message, which perhaps isn't brought out quite so clearly in this passage, but is uh, uh, shown in others, is that the tongue, powerful as it is, can be controlled. Not by us. The more we try, probably the more we'll mess it up. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can really make a difference. James produces more pictures at this point to show that the, the, the problem of being inconsistent, that if we say one thing one time and something totally different another time, we're, we're, we're not uh, being true to ourselves. Um, the picture of fresh water and salt water coming out of the same spring, or a fig tree bearing olives, or a grapevine bearing figs. 
by your words you will know them i mean it's not just by deeds it's not just by lives it's the words that show people what you're like uh, and so uh, it's really with the Holy Spirit's help that we can use our tongues in the right way. Uh, and so um, what I'm going to suggest now is three ways in which uh, with the, the, the help and the prompting of the Holy Spirit, we can control those troublesome tongues. And they begin with R, S and T. R is respectful that when you're speaking to somebody well look at them with god's eyes think of them as creatures uh, 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 people who god made and therefore give them some respect even if they're from a background which might uh, initially seem really bad to you make sure that you treat them as fellow human beings uh, and don't immediately trying to to uh, uh, insult them or worse um, just vent your own feelings on them by shouting at them or whatever s stands for sincere what we say is going to be a reflection of our own personality and therefore it's no good just pretending to be better than we are there's uh, room perhaps for more uh, open acknowledgement of, of our faults um, for example in church on a Sunday morning just talking to people and not uh, being sincere not trying to uh, cover things up and, and pretend that, that we're all perfect because we know we're not and the third one is T is truthful uh, and we need to speak the truth they have to be a bit careful here because sometimes um, speaking the truth in love can be just a, a cover up for saying uh, bluntly things which uh, are which may be true, but which are going to hurt the other person uh, and really shouldn't be said uh, in that way, if at all. So respectful, sincere and truthful. But uh, above the R, S and T. Uh, comes L. Our words need to be loving. They need to be in the right context. They need to make sure that the person is being encouraged and built up, not pulled down in any way. One of the things I do during the summer is umpire cricket. And one of the things an umpire has to try and get right uh, is an LBW decision. And you're, you're taught as an umpire not to give an instant decision, but to run things through in your mind. Was it pitching in line or was it outside the leg stump? Did it hit the pad or did it hit the bat first? Sometimes it's difficult to tell. And the third thing, was it going on to hit the stumps or would it perhaps have been going over them? You just weigh those things up in your mind and then you may raise the dreaded finger to say out in the same way before we speak or before we write maybe we need to run things through in our minds is this going to be helpful is it really necessary to say it uh, could it be said in another way and so james shows us the power of the tongue uh, and it's a real warning to make sure that we use it in the right way uh, but let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us in this, to prompt us, to um, give us some uh, tips, as it were, how to control the tongue and how to use it so that everything we say will, in the same way that everything we do, give glory to God and uh, encourage uh, and build up our fellow human beings rather than pulling them down. my mind 
to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. body bowed and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the ancient seal by heavy stone Messiah still and all
Thank you, David, for your sermon. Let's turn our minds to pray. We pray for the world leaders, politicians, national and local, with meetings and reshuffling of the cabinet, that they will work to bring restoration, healing, not just for their own nations and people, but for all people. We pray also for the healing of the world that we all share. Lord, have mercy. Keep safe, Lord, near ones and dear ones, those who are far as well, as many are still unable to travel, and protect all of us who are in danger, for your name's sake, who have to hide rather than confess that they are believers. So please bring to mind people and places you know where Christians are being persecuted for being believers. Lord, have mercy. Help and comfort the lonely, the bereaved and the oppressed. Heal the sick in body and mind and provide for homeless, the hungry and the destitute. And again, as we continue thinking about autumn or winter and how COVID can be kept at night, at bay. Lord, have mercy. Lord, show your pity on us. And in turn, we can show pity on the refuge, on the prisoner, on those who are in trouble. Keep trouble away from our shores, from our homes, our streets and our churches. Lord, have mercy. Forgive those who lie about us, those who consider us to be their enemies, those who persecute and slander. So Lord, help us to forgive as you said in your prayer and turn their hearts, Lord, as we've turned our hearts to know your forgiveness and your salvation. Lord, have mercy. Hear us as we remember those who have died in the peace of Christ, both those who have confessed the faith and those whose faith is known only to you alone, and grant us with them a share in your kingdom. Lord, have mercy. Finally, as our Saviour taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Sam! Sam, where are you? No notices. Back in two weeks. Thank you, Sam, for the notices. As we come to the end of today's new every morning, I've chosen a song that follows on from the reading and the sermons about the Church of Christ, that's you and me, about the living, living out what Christ has asked, to love and to serve the Church of Christ in every age. So every blessing.
bless the Lord and thanks be to God. Go forth into our week in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good and noble and honourable. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour everyone. Love and serve the Lord, witnessing to his sacrifice and always rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of Father Almighty, Son and Holy Spirit, be amongst us and remain with us, now and always. Amen.